Okay, I hope my screen's being shared now, and we'll talk about the beginnings of the, the SEEP project, uh, measuring the environmental benefits of conservation. SEEP began, wait a minute, uh, let's see, something's not coming on, all right, here we go. Uh, SEEP began somewhat uh, before 2002, in the late 90s, a group uh, in uh, looking at data development, looking at how to measure soil quality. Uh, we're looking uh, at seeing what our national resources inventory provided us. Uh, had lots of information about landscape uh, data and crop rotations, but nothing on management. And then there was the ERS arm survey that would get detailed management uh, only on one crop, not crop rotations, and they didn't do it. Uh, nation, you know, not every state is surveyed on every crop. So uh, the the rudiments of the seat project were uh, the cropland portion were were there, and with OMB wanting more outcome based reporting, uh, extending back into the Clinton administration for outcome uh, reporting, and then the 2000 Farm Bill that increased uh, funding for conservation significantly, but it also came with the caveats that we need to have better accountability. So uh, this assessment uh, was then going to be developed and going to be used to guide future development of, for conservation programs and to see how those uh, programs are getting implemented. Uh, it was a, at the start, was a very broad project with lots of partners getting it off the ground. It's, uh, this is something that had never been done uh, by any entities in anywhere, and not in, only in the United States, but anywhere in the world had tried to do this type of effort. Uh, so we have lots of input from lots of partners. You can see a big chunk of USDA uh, was part of the steering committee along with EPA, USGS, and, and many others, and a lot of land-grant universities and uh, NGOs like uh, Soil and Water Conservation Society, Nature Conservancy, and, and the alphabetic list goes on and on for all the partners that were there. I think we ended up closely, we were to close to 60 or so that provided input over time. So along with that came the development of a Blue Ribbon Panel. It was organized and, and uh, uh, a report written by SWCS. Uh, it was an OMB requirement. In fact, the OMB had a lot to, to deal with. That's the Office of Management and Budget. Uh, we had to get everything improved by them since we were interacting with the general public. And anytime you interact with a survey with the public, uh, you have to go through OMB requirements. And every time we make a change in any of our questions, it has to go back to them and we have to justify, justify why we did that. Uh, had several NGOs, we had a balance of production oriented NGOs and environmental oriented NGOs and, and academia. And our procedures, our modeling of the model itself, our procedures in our initial draft reports were reviewed by well over 350 professionals from agriculture, environment and policy makers. So it was a, a, a big, extraordinarily extensive review of this. Uh, we made lots of changes over time in doing the writing uh, and, made, and uh, it was quite an arduous process. But once that's established uh, for seat one, then seat two, it was a lot easier since OMB said, as long as you didn't have any major changes in your efforts and were responding to reviews and, and, and ran that right back by them, uh, we didn't have to go through such an extensive review for C2, but the Blue Ribbon Panel wrote a report on recommendations and, and we followed uh, many, if not all, those recommendations. So the goals were to quantify the conservation practice adoption on the landscape, using the model, to est the APEX model to estimate the benefits. Uh, we also use the SWOT model to look at in-stream benefits. Uh, we use it to also identify outstanding conservation needs where we see excess uh, losses of uh, soil or nutrients um, or, uh, or anything else, we would uh, look at that as a conservation need. And then we'd look at different ways using alternative scenarios in our modeling processes to, uh, to implement uh, better landscape management and improve soil and water quality. So the basis, the statistical basis and the framework is built off our national resources inventory. Uh, which are about, uh, there's about 240,000 cropland points, but in all land uses, there's uh, uh, nearly a million points 
uh, distributed across the U.S. that we've actually been looking at since 1978. So we've got a rich history of, of the land use and some, some little bit of conservation on there, but mostly the land use changes uh, across time uh, with these different types. Each one of these, we have detailed soils information at each of these points. They were visited uh, individually by NRCS uh, soil scientists and agronomists. And so lots of information were collected on these points at the beginning of it and continue to be collected uh, at some fashion. Um, along with that, uh, we use um, FSA, Farm Services Administration, uh, we use their data for the, like CRP and CCRP and CREP practices. Uh, we use the NRCS's field offices and then our primary source of information on the management of these area, these fields is from a, a farmer survey. And that's a, a detailed one-on-one -on -one survey. I'll talk a little bit more about that. All that information goes into our apex model, which is a field scale model that runs on a daily time step to give us uh, information. And we'll talk a little more about that as well. What leaves the edge of the field, which is what the APEX model is designed to do, is then transferred to the SWAT model that ARS uh, does for us. And they, they transfer the loads that are lost at the edge of the field into the streams to get an idea of the impact on water quality downstream from, from management efforts upstream. I kind of already discussed how that worked is that you picked up the information at the sample point sites it goes to the field level model. So we get on-site field level effects, but then we also get the off-site uh, larger water quality effects. This is just to give you an idea of, of the, uh, where, the, where the cropland is in the US. Uh, the, ignore the shaded portions at the time this was, was built. Actually, this is where all the uh, reports that we wrote from C1 are from these watersheds. Uh, the areas on the outside of that, we had some issues with the, the sampling and did not quite meet the statistical requirements until we made some adjustments later, uh, but we didn't write reports on those. But this gives you a, a good uh, idea of, of uh, where our sample points are. Uh, I'll point out on the next slide, some of the changes that we made. So in SEEP1, this is uh, basically all the river basins that we looked at and attempted to dry, be able to write a report about each one of them. Uh, in doing so, we learned there were some problems and I guess the classic case would be the Missouri River Basin where you have you know more subhumid to humid uh, crop production systems in this corner and more arid to semi-arid crop productions primarily wheat production systems in in this northwestern portion so looking at the impact of conservation across those broad crop systems and and uh, climate types was was problematic so in C2, we went to more production region based. Um, and we made these production regions to, to, to group similar crop production systems. Uh, hopefully we have some similarities in, in a lot of the climate that's there. So the conservation solutions that would be associated with those production practices would be more closely uh, aligned with one another and increase our statistical power by not having uh, large expanses of, and uh, huge differences in, in cropping systems. So we changed these things around. Uh, some of them were also uh, adjusted for resource concerns uh, that were similar. So if you look at the Southern Plains, you can obviously see the South Texas and Nebraska are gonna have different climates, but that's pretty much where our current wind erosion issues are with cropland. So uh, we, we grouped them in that fashion for that one in, in particular. So there were, you know, reasons other than cropping systems uh, that we put these together. Uh, but most of the time we, we stuck with trying to keep light cropping systems together. So the survey for every point, we get three years of information and it's, it's literally like a three year diary of everything you did on that, on that field, that one field. Uh, one of the other things about it, OMB only allows us to ask a farmer one time about one field. We, if, the, if they operate, 30,000 acres, then we only talk about one field for them. We can't ask them again about any other fields. And if they operate 30 acres and they got one field, that's all we can ask them about, obviously. So uh, those are issues that as, as agriculture consolidates more, we have larger uh, major landowners or operators, uh, then we're gonna need to maybe uh, figure ways to statistically allow them to do more than one if they're willing. But we get the crop growth, crops grown, seeding rates, uh, anything about the crop production system that, that's out there, the uh, row widths, we collect all that type of information. 
Uh, we haven't reported on all of it, but we collect it just in case. Uh, but the nutrient applications, and especially including manure, we get very detailed information from them on that. Uh, same thing with pesticides, uh, tillage operations, you know, what implement did you use, what day did you use it, uh, that type of thing. Uh, and then irrigation practices. We had uh, upgraded and have a very extensive set of questions on irrigation practices. Uh, we follow that with any conservation practices that they know that has been installed or any program participation that they're aware of. Uh, this is one of those things that as land gets rented, you know, the, the landowner may have uh, installed some of these practices and, and uh, the renter may not have, so sometimes they don't. Uh, answer the question as if the practice exists or if they applied it themselves, but we, that's why we collect all this other information from other data sources. So the key thing about the survey is that it's, it's literally the farmer's voice. Uh, it's, it's confidential. We, keep, we are very serious about that uh, because uh, of many reasons we want to keep that confidentially there to protect the, the landowner. We want to assure them that their answers aren't going to be spread out everywhere and therefore we get a you know, a more truthful set of answers from them. So they don't gain the system in, in regards. So it's, it's very confidential. We're, we're very um, reluctant to share the data uh, readily. Uh, and in fact, every time we, every single time with the exception of sharing data with Colorado State for greenhouse gas emission estimates, uh, the, the agreement has been violated in some form or fashion. They either uh, produced, uh, used, uh, published data that, that led to a breach of confidentiality, or they misused the data in doing things like writing an entire report on the tails of the data and not what the meat of the data has. So we've had trouble with that, although we are continually asked to be more uh, sharing with the data. We, we are uh, constantly looking for ways to, to do that, but do that to protect the, the farmer it, themselves. The other key point about this is that we capture all the conservation out there, be it self-adopted that would show up in no one's databases, uh, that which is technical assistance only, those in NRCS, no conservation technical assistance program where there's no financial involvement. We just help them uh, instruct them on a certain pr practice. And then of course the financial assistance from, from farm programs as, as well as any financial assistance from state level and and some of the local uh, led conservation efforts that are out there. There aren't that many that in, in the country that do that, but there are some that are out there that do that. Just to go back to the, to the survey, it's 44 pages long. I think the average last time out was about a 77 minute uh, on average is how long it took. Uh, and a numerator actually goes to the uh, operator's house or home or wherever they decide to meet and they go over the go over the survey uh, and, and write down the responses from from the from the operator. So it again covers three years of production, covers everything about production systems and uh, it's it's very extensive survey again 44 pages and uh, really gets in some detail. It's just, just a screen capture of the top. It's in, in I think in, in different sections you can see manure is section E. Uh, I think we go to, to section K or L, uh, that one would have a lot of uh, demographic information. But you can, you know, looking at the, this, you can see we ask them if they even use manure or, or compost on the field. And then we start beginning to ask questions about the manure itself, how much was applied, uh, you know, whether it was in pounds, tons, bushels, gallons, whatever they applied it in. Um, and then who, where was the manure produced? Did you, uh, was it on the operation, purchased, et cetera? and then what form it's in. Uh, and also did you do a manure test? And this is just one of, there's three full pages of questions um, uh, on manure in the survey itself. Here's kind of another headline of it. If you did get, they did get a manure test. And you know, over the year, the, the two surveys, we've got about 2,000, maybe 3,000 or more different individual manure tests that that someone may find of use uh, for. Um, then against the source, and you can see up here the sources that we asked them for up here and then uh, how it was applied. So we try to get the four R's and, and even about their, their handling and composting and, and those type things um, are part of the survey. So with all the data collected, we enter it into the apex model. And basically what we're doing is tracking where water 
uh, is moving and where wind is moving and whatever the wind in the water takes with it, whether it runs off the surface, percolates through the, the soil system down into a shallow aquifer and to lateral flow or down into deeper aquifers. Uh, we even look at the evapotranspiration as well as uh, uh, some gas losses for volatilization and denitrification. So we look at all the different ways material comes into the, the soil system and all the different ways it moves out of it uh, is all done by the apex model. And the apex model is it's 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 actually a model that is running an extensive number of other models that are known by many people and used individually. Uh, these are all integrated. Then we also have some other routines that are taken from bit, bits and pieces of, of people that have studied uh, different natural processes and developed some type of a uh, prediction equation from those. We'll move those in there as well. But all these different models are working together on a daily time step. So when one of them changes the input value that another one is using, uh, that becomes that new model's input. And it's, it's, like I said, running constantly every day. And these are, you know, these are the different things that comes out of it or, and goes into it. It does have an economics function that we don't use, but it is, it is there. Uh, but it goes through, you know, we, we, in the modeling, we actually have a weather station for every 12 digit hop. And when we get out to, towards the west, we have some orographic effects on the weather. We start matching it more to elevation in nearby 12 digit hucks than we do with the, just being in the hub. So uh, we try to get as detailed weather as possible for that point so we get the best estimate of how that conservation system is uh, uh, functioning as far as keeping nutrients and soil in place and providing production. That's one of the key things we, we always uh, keep in the front is to make sure we have the yield rights because if yields and crop nutrient uptake isn't correct, none of the other estimates are correct. So any modeling efforts you look at, uh, if they don't mention how they calibrated towards yields, you probably don't want to look at the results because they may, may be meaningless. Some of the things we can do, uh, Tari talked about irrigation, but we can do different, different ways of drainage. We can do drainage water management in different ways, uh, furrow diking, uh, buffer strips, filter strips, terraces, waterways, uh, about every type of activity. And, and I think of, of all the different practices we have in the NRCS, we're probably simulating, or I have the ability to simulate about 50 to 60 of those in, in one way or another. So we, we get a pretty big extension, extensive ability to, um, to model a bunch of our practices out there uh, when needed. And that concludes my, my history and, and a little overview of the SEAT model. 